Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law. By request of someone on the channel who is sponsoring this, I'm going to cover the case of Wickard v. Filberg. So thank you very much for the super chat to sponsor this coverage. I is appreciated. Wickard v. Filburn is one of my least favorite cases of all time from the U.S. Supreme Court 1942 decision. The short version of it is that there is a piece of land, a person is growing things for their own use, and they can't because the federal government says they can't. Whether or not it's commerce or not. Apparently the answer is yes. We're going to read this case and we're going to discuss it. So let's get started with this. The appellee, that would be Mr. Filburn, filed this complaint against the Secretary of Agriculture of the United States. And this is in 1943, I remember. Three members of the County Agricultural Commission for Montgomery County, Ohio, and a mem member of the State Agricultural Commission. He sought to enjoin enforcement against himself of a marketing penalty imposed by an amendment of 1941 from the Agricultural Adjustment Act of 1938 upon the part of his crop, that, which was made available for marketing in excess of the marketing quota established for his farm. So one of the things the U.S. government is trying to do is control the price of wheat and corn and other assets. And they're, they, they're providing a guaranteed price. And one of the things they want to do is, is make sure how much people can grow. So his particular farm has a quota. You can grow this much and not more uh, anymore. He's grown more than that. And the federal law says you can't grow more than that. Okay, let's read on. The secretary moved to dismiss the action for improper venue, but Lair waived the objection and filed an answer. The other appellants moved to dismiss on the ground. They had no authority to enforce the wheat marketing quota provisions of the act. After the motion was denied, they answered, reserving exceptions. The case was submitted on stipulated facts. So here are the stipulated facts. So we went just on facts as stipulated. So there's no facts in dispute, just a pure issue of law. Mr. Filburn, the appellee, had for many years owned and operated a small farm in Montgomery County, Ohio, maintaining a herd of dairy cattle, selling milk, raising poultry, and selling poultry and eggs. It has been his practice to raise a small acreage of winter wheat, sown in fall and harvested the following of July, to sell a portion of that crop to feed a portion to his poultry and livestock, some of which is sold, some of which is making flour for human consumption, and keep the rest for seeding. The intended disposition of the crop here has not yet been expressly stated. In July of 1940, pursuant to the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the, there was established for the appellee a wheat allotment of 11.1 acres for his farm and a normal yield of 20.1 of bushels of wheat per acre. So he's allowed to make 11.1 acres and 20 bushels per acre. So that is, well, you do the math, about 22 bushels. He was given notice of this allotment. He sowed, however, 23 acres and harvested from the 11.9 acres of excess anchorage, 239 bushels, under which the term of the act constituted the farm marking excess subject to a penalty of 49 cents a bushel or $117. Or $117. So he had some excess land, he grew some excess wheat on said land, and so it is subject to a penalty for 49 cents a bushel. So, these are $1940, so a little bit more important there. The appellee has not paid the penalty, and he's not postponed or avoided it by storing the excess under regulations or by delivering it up to the secretary. So you wouldn't have to pay for it if you just gave us the wheat. So if you just forfeit the wheat to us, that's cool. You could do that. The committee therefore refused a marketing card, which under the terms of regulations is necessary to protect a buyer from liability to the penalty and protecting a lien. So he has denied this license because of his temerity in having too much land and growing too much wheat. The general scheme of the Agriculture Act is what relates to the, to control the volume of movement of interstate and foreign commerce in order to avoid surplus and storage and consequently abnormal low or high wheat prices and obstruction of commerce. So the, the goal of this thing, the goal of this thing is to regulate the price of wheat by federal law. Centralized regulation of price. That sounds suspiciously communist. But that's where we are. We want to control the price. We want to control how much it's sold for. We don't want a free market, apparently, in the U.S. government. No, we don't want a free government. We want to control the price and volume of wheat. We don't want to have too much wheat. We don't want to have too low. We don't want the price to be too high. We don't want the price to be too low. We want to, in dictatorial fashion, say exactly how much you can grow, this much and no more, and this is the price you can buy it for. This sounds very centralized control-y to me. Yeah. 
Within the limits and prescribed standards is directed to ascertain and proclaim each year a national acreage allotment for the next crop of wheat, which is then apportioned to the states and then counties and broken up into farms. So the Secretary of Agriculture says, here's how much wheat can be grown in the entire U.S. Here's the total number. Here's the total number. And then they get split up by states and counties and farms. You can have no more than this. This is exactly how much farmland you're allowed. Encouraging. Loans and payments to wheat are farmers are authorized in state of circumstances. The act further provides that whenever it appears a total surplus of wheat at the beginning of the any year will exceed a normal year supply of more than 35%, it shall so proclaim on May 15th, and during the marking year, a compulsory, a compulsory national marketing quota shall be established with respect to marketing of wheat. So if it grows beyond the limitations we set up forth arbitrarily, we're going to have a quota. Excellent. Beyond the issuance of the proclamation on June the 10th, however, must conduct a referendum of farmers will be subject to determine where they favor or oppose it. And if they do, they must do some other stuff to suspend operation. The Secretary of Agriculture made a radio address to wheat farmers in which he advocated approval of quotas and caused attention to the pendency of the amendment of 1941 which at the time had been sent by Congress to the White House and pointed out for provision for increase on loan of wheat to 85 cents of each parity. It made no mention of the fact that it also increased the penalty from 15 cents to 98 cents. But also stated, because of uncertain world situations, we deliberately planned several million acres of wheat. Farmers should not be penalized because they provide insurance against the shortages of food. So the court below said that this was no good. So what does the Supreme Court want to say? The Supreme Court wants to say the holding of the trial court, the court below, the Secretary's speech in validating the referendum is a manifest error. But as a whole, in the context of world events that constitute the principal theme, the penalties of which he's spoken with were likely in the form of ruinous low prices resulted from excess supply rather than from penalties prescribed in the act. Under any interpretation, the speech cannot be given effect of invalidating the referendum. There's no evidence any voter put upon the Secretary's word the interpretation that misled the court or it was misled. There's no showing the speech influenced outside the referendum. The record, in fact, does not show this. So he's saying that you improperly interfered with this referendum you were supposed to do from your speech. But the court said, no, that's cool. The secretary is allowed to interfere with the referendum by the voters, so or by the farmers. So he's allowed to exercise his speech. So that's not a problem. It is urged under the Commerce Clause. Congress does not possess the power it is in this instance sought to exercise. That's what I think. The question would merit little consideration since our decision in Darby sustained the federal power to regulate production of goods for commerce, except for the fact this act extends federal regulation to production not intended of any part of commerce, but wholly for consumption on the farm. So that was the distinguishment between Darby and this case, right? So under Darby, there, there was limits on what you could do in terms of commerce. But here, the issue was it went to even stuff that was used on the farm. Because a lot of what Philburn was doing was growing the wheat for consumption on the farm, for his own flour, for his own animals, and so forth and so on. So the question is, essentially, is can interstate commerce attach to the things you're growing on your own farm for your own consumption? So you're growing it, you're going to consume it. Does the interstate commerce clause allow you to regulate that? The prior case, Darby said you could regulate if you're putting into commerce because of interstate commerce. But here, you're not selling it. Is that commerce? And if so, is it interstate commerce? You are consuming the food you grow on your own land. Is that interstate? Is that commerce? That's the question. The act includes a definition of market as derivatives, so it's related to wheat and addition to conventional meat. It also disposes of feeding it to the poultry or livestock, the products of which are sold, bought, or exchanged, or so to be disposed of. So one of the ways that they've done this historically is look to the secondary, tertiary, and whatever the following mechanisms of that is. So even if what you're doing is not interstate speech, interstate, it would affect interstate, because you're feeding it to chickens, you're going to sell the chickens. That's theirs. So we can regulate the wheat because you're going to sell the chickens that, that eat that wheat. Oh, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to eat the chickens too? Um, okay, you're going to do something else, and that's commerce. You're going to sell the feathers, right? Okay, the feathers grew because of the wheat they, ew, they, they eat, so we can regulate that. We can regulate the wheat because of the feathers you're going to sell. So because you're going to sell the feathers, we can regulate the chicken, we, so therefore we can regulate the wheat. So they do this wonderful chain reasoning thing. Like you, you, can't, you can't govern how I grow my tomatoes. Are you going to use fertilizer? Yes. 
then we can govern the tomatoes. What do you mean? Well, the fertilizer is interstate commerce, so we can regulate the tomatoes themselves. Yeah, so this kind of chain reasoning is, is something they use a lot too. The marking quo is not only a brace that what may be sold without penalty, but what may be consumed on the premises. Somehow that's interstate commerce. We produced on excess acreage is designed as available for marking, and so the penalty is there for mom. Penalties do not determine whether any part of the wheat, either sold with or without quota, is sold or intended to be sold. We don't have to worry about whether it's sold or intended to be sold. We have to worry about that in determining whether it's commerce, whether it's sold or intended to be sold. We don't have to worry about that. The sum of all this is federal government fixes a quota, including all a farmer may harvest for sale on his own farm needs and declares that we produce in excess may neither be disposed of nor used except in payment of penalty or stored. The appellee says this regulation, this is regulation of the product and consumption of wheat. Such activities, he urges, are beyond congressional power under the Commerce Clause since they're local in character and their effect on interstate commerce is the most indirect. In answer, the government argues that the statute's regulation neither produces nor consumption, but only marketing. An alternative, if the act does not go beyond the regulation is sustainable as necessary and proper. The government's concern, lest the act be held to be a regulation of production or consumption, rather than marketing, is attributable to food dictum decisions of this court, which might be understood to lay down activities such as production, marketing, and mining are strictly local and except in certain circumstances, which are not present here, cannot be regulated under commerce power because the effects on interstate commerce are, as a matter, only indirect. Even today, where this power has been held to be in great latitude, yeah, a little bit, a little bit great latitude, yeah, that's a part of the problem. There's no decision of this court that such activities may be regulated when no part of the product is intended for interstate commerce or intermingled with subjects thereof. Yet yeah, intermingled with subjects thereof gets you a long way because it gets you a whole causal, con causal connection. So if you can somehow grow stuff on your own land that in no way affects interstate commerce, then maybe. But you're going to feed it to chickens who are going to be sold. You're going to, you're going to, the chickens will lay eggs. Those will be sold, right? There's somewhere, somehow, that's, that's touching interstate commerce. So no, no matter how attenuated. So that indirect can get pretty indirect. Beca because, because you're going to sell the eggs from the chickens that feed the wheat, we can regulate the wheat. We believe review of this course's decision on the Commerce Clause will make plain, however, questions of the power of Congress are not going to be decided by any reference, which would give me, be given control to such nomenclature, such as production and indirect, and foreclose consideration of the actual effects of the activity upon the interstate commerce. Ooh. At the beginning, Chief Justice Marshall described the Federal Commerce Clause with a breath never yet exceeded. He made emphatic that embracing the penetrating nature of the power by warning the effective restraints on the exercise must proceed from political rather than judicial processes. In other words, if you are concerned about the Commerce Clause, don't come to a court about it. We're not going to do anything about it. All the things are commerce. Everything is commerce. For nearly a century, however, decisions of the course under the Commerce Clause dealt rarely with questions of what Congress might do and exercise a grant of power under the clause, almost entirely with the permissibility of state activity, which is claimed discriminated against or burdened interstate commerce. So there they're talking a little bit what's about what's called the Dormant Commerce Clause. So there's the Commerce Clause that you know, which deals directly with what the federal government can do, and what's called the Dormant Commerce Clause, which is what, what the states can do. States, as a general matter, can't put up tariffs, tariffs can't put up barriers, can't put up things that regulate their own businesses. So they're saying that the century before 1941, from 1841 to 1941, they're saying we've basically been discussing the Dormant Commerce Clause. What states can and cannot do in terms of regulating commerce. That's what we've been discussing. We've really dealt with stuff outside that. And we're not going to start now for some reason. During this period, there's perhaps little occasion for the affirmative exercise of the Commerce Clause. That would be a good reason why you didn't hear any cases. And the influence of the clause on American life and law was negative, resulting almost wholly from the operation as a restraint of the power of the states. Yeah, it was nothing. The Congress, in, Congress initially was just making sure that there was regulation of interstate commerce and making sure that there wasn't one state being crappy to another state. That was what Congress was doing, regulating interstate commerce to make sure it would occur and it would flow and there wouldn't be tariffs and barriers and all sorts of stuff. So there wasn't much occasion to answer these questions because Congress wasn't doing that. But now they are going to do that. They're going to do something different. They're going to go directly to what a person can and cannot do directly. That's concerning. In discussing and decision, deciding the point of reference, instead of being what was necessary and proper, was also a concept of sovereignty thought to be implicit. Certain activities, such as production, manufacturing, and mining, were occasionally said to be within the province of state government and beyond the power of Congress under the Commerce Clause. 
So there were some cases from before, there were some cases from before that some activities were beyond interstate commerce. What a novel concept. So there were some cases from before that said activities such as production, manufacturing, and mining might be beyond the Commerce Clause, which kind of makes sense because mining is going to be wholly within a state. It's going to be wholly within regulated by the state. Even if, it, even if the mine crosses state lines, the two states in question will, will each monitor their own respective half. So mining will occur wholly in state. There's probably not a lot of plants that straddle state lines. Plants will be wholly within states. Manufacturing, production, farms are going to be wholly within states. Again, not a lot of farms are probably crossing state lines. And to the extent they are, again, we could segregate each part of them. So there are some cases in the long, long ago, in the forgotten, in the forgotten time, there was cases in the long, long ago, in the forgotten time, which said that things that happened wholly within a state might not be interstate. Deep. And maybe interstate commerce deals with what happens or doesn't happen as those goods transverse state lines. Maybe the point of interstate commerce clause is to make sure there will be interstate commerce. Maybe the point is to make sure there's a free flow of goods, and Congress's interest here is ensuring that occurs. And if the state is putting up barriers and restrictions on trade, to not let that happen. And otherwise, states, you regulate production, you regulate manufacturing, you regulate mining. But these were cases in the long, long ago, in the forgotten times. It wasn't until 1887, with the, the enactment of the Interstate Commerce Act, the Interstate Commerce Clause began to exert a positive influence in American law and life. So there, they're referring to positive in the sense of positive law versus negative law, because they used that phraseology before. So before, it was all negative. Negative rights, negative law, negative power, negative influence. Negative in the sense of preventing things from happening. So before 1887, Congress was doing negative stuff on interstate commerce. State, you may not. State, you may not prevent this from happening. State, you may not put up this barrier. State, you may not put up this tariff. State, you may not put up this tax. Negative. Negative rights. And then in 1887, they said, wait a second. What if we turn this into a positive power? State, you must. Not you cannot, but you must. Yeah. This is negative power versus positive power. So before 1887, Congress was doing was negative power. After 1887, positive power. And it's never been the same way ever since. The first important federal resort to commerce power was followed in 19, 1897 by the Sherman Antitrust Act, and mainly followed by 1903 by many others. These statutes ushered in phrases of adjudication, which require the court to interpret the Commerce Clause in light of exercise of power thereafter. When it first dealt with the new legislation, the court adhered to its earlier pronouncements. So, initially... The court respected its initial precedent. Initially, the court respected its precedent. Initially said, okay, we're going to interpret this new legislation, but we're actually going to honor our precedent. There's some things that are actually, you know, not interstate, despite this power power. So previously, the, the court said, we're going to obey our precedent. But then the court decided that our precedent is stupid. The earliest pronouncements also played an important part in several five cases which the court held to be acts of Congress. Even when writing these important positions, in the light of the restrictive authority, however, the cases called forth broader interpretations of the Commerce Clause, designed to supersede earlier ones, that's one way to put it, and to bring about a return of principles first enumerated by Chief Justice Marshall. Not so long after United States v. Knight, Justice Holmes, in a sustaining exercise of national power over intrastate activity, intrastate activity, in sustaining the exercise of national power over intrastate activity, stated the court that the commerce among the states is not a technical legal conception, but a practical one drawn from a course of business. It was soon demonstrated the effects of many types of interstate commerce upon the interstate commerce was such to make them a proper exercise of federal regulation. No, 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 no. If you want to talk about goods traveling across state lines, I'm all aboard. That's what the Interstate Commerce Clause is meant to do. It's effectively designed to facilitate an open trade. It's designed to ensure the free flow of goods from state to state. That's what the Interstate Commerce Clause is about. But now they're going beyond that. So, good times. In some cases, sustaining the exercise of federal power over the interstate matters, that would be matters having totally within a state. The term direct was used for the purpose of staying rather than reaching a result. And other times it was synonymous with substantial material. And others it was not used. Of late, it's been abandoned in cases dealing with this. We can regulate things happening wholly within a state for some reason. 
In the Shreveport rate cases, the court held railroad rates of an admittedly intrastate charter fixed by the authority of the state might nevertheless be revi revised by the federal government because of the economic effects in which they had on interstate commerce. So we can we can affect the ticket price of a train happening wholly within the state lines for some reason. At least that's commerce in some sense, because people are buying and selling things. So at least it's, at least if it's at least if it's intrastate, at least so we 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 move we move look look how this is happening in degrees, right? We move from interstate commerce, right, and now they say, well, maybe intrastate too. So interstate means both intra and intra, but it still has to be commerce at this point in history. The opinion by Hughes found a federal intervention constitutionally authorized because matters such as having close and substantial relationship to interstate traffic, the control is essential or appropriate to effectuate the interstate service and maintain conditions under which the interstate commerce may be conducted upon fair terms and without molestation or hindrance. The court's recognition of relevant economic effects in the application of commerce clause in fact, and emphasized by the statement, may, may, may mechanical applications of legal formulas no longer feasible. So, all those mechanical legal principles that we have, we're just going to throw those away. We are we we can't we can't buy by those distinctions we used to have anymore. Those those are no good. Once an economic measure of the reach of the power granted Congress in the Commerce Clause is accepted, questions about power cannot be decided simply by finding the activity in question to be a production nor can be decided by the economic effects before closed by calling them indirect. The present Chief Justice said in summary of the present law, the Commerce Clause is not confined to the exercise of regulation of commerce among the states. It extends its activities, interstates, which so affects intrastate commerce, or exertion of power over it, as to make regulation of them appropriate to the attainment of a legitimate end. The effectuation of grand power to regulate interstate commerce. Intrastate, interstate commerce, what's the difference? The power of the Congress over interstate commerce is plenary, and, comp and complete in itself, may be exercised to the utmost extent, and acknowledges no limitations other than those prescribed in the Constitution. It follows that no form of state activity can be constitutionally thwart the regulatory authority granted to the Congress. Hence, the power to reach those interstate activities which substantially interfere with or obstruct the exercise of power. And by substantially interfere with, we mean in any way, in any sense, could in any way be held to, in any sense, impact it. That's what we mean by substantially interfere. When the subject of regulation in question was production, consumption, or marketing, therefore not material to the purpose of deciding the question of federal power, that activity's local character may in any doubt be helpful to determining whether Congress intended to reach it. The same consideration might be helped in determining whether the absence of congressional absolutely would be permissible for the state to exercise its power over subject matter, even though in doing so it may to some degree affect interstate commerce. Yeah, but if the power activity may be local, and though it might not be regarded as commerce. Pay attention. But even if Apelli's activity be local, and though it not be regarded as commerce, local and non-commerce, it stay still, whatever its nature, be reached by Congress. Are you listening to these words? Are you listening? Even if the activity be local and not regarded by commerce, it may be reached by commerce if, if it exerts a substantial economic effect on commerce. And this is irrespective of whether the effect might have been called direct or indirect. Local non-commerce is interstate commerce. The parties have stipulated the summary of economics of the wheat industry. Commerce among the states of wheat is large and important. Although wheat is raised in every state but one. I don't know what state that is at this time in history. 1940, whatever. I'm not sure what state that would be. Is Hawaii a member state yet? No. So, I don't know, Arizona? Anyways, although weight is raised in every state but one, production in most states is not equal to consumption. 16 states on average have a surplus of wheat above their own requirements for food, feed, seed, and food. 32 states in the District of Columbia, which production have been consumption, have overlooked the wheat surplus states for over their supply, as well as wheat for export and carryover. Is this still precedent? Yes. Yes, Big C Burger, this is very precedent. This is this is precedent. This is this is at the root. This is at the root of every commerce clause case since then. Every case in commerce clause has this lurking in the background. This is very precedent. This is very precedent. Yes. I wish it wouldn't be because I hate this case with a burning passion that words cannot adequately describe. But yes, it is precedent. 
The wheat industry has been a problem industry for some years, largely as a result of increased foreign production and import. Annual exports of wheat and flour have this, this cries. Many con countries have sought to modify the impact. I don't care what other countries are doing. In the absence of regulation, the price of wheat in the United States would be affected. I don't care. Differences in farming conditions make these benefits to different wheat growers. I don't care. Don't care. We're talking about the okay. The effect of consumption of hung, the effect of consumption on homegrown wheat of interstate commerce is due to the fact it constitutes the most variable factor in the disappearance of the wheat crop. Consumption on the farm where it grows appears to vary in any amount to 20% of the average production. The total amount wheat consumed as food varies relatively little and seed relatively consistent. The maintenance by government regulation of price for wheat undoubtedly can be accomplished by effectively sustaining or increasing demand by limiting supply. The effect of the statute before us is to restrict the amount which may be produced for market and the extent to which one may forestall to resort to market by producing their own needs. I'll read that again so you can make sure you understand it clearly. The effect of the statute before us is to restrict the amount which may be produced for market and the extent to which to one may forestall resort to the market by producing to meet his own needs. Okay, so if you didn't understand what that meant, I'll translate it for you. If you grow wheat yourself, you would false, you would forestall your resort to the market. You wouldn't resort to the market, right? I want wheat. What you would normally do is you would resort to the market and you'd buy wheat. But if you produce your own wheat, you would forestall your resort to the market. Because you wouldn't have to go to the market because you have your own wheat. So, the effect of the statute before us is to restrict the amount which may be produced, thus the amount to which you wouldn't have to go to the market. Because if you could grow more wheat, you wouldn't have to buy it. And that would hurt commerce because you weren't buying it, you see, because you're growing it. So the effect of the statute here is to force you to go into the market and buy wheat Buy wheat. You must buy wheat. I want to grow my own wheat. You can't. You can't grow wheat. You can't grow wheat. You must buy wheat. Because we want to forestall your resort to the market. Yep, this is still good law. The appellee's own contribution to the demand for wheat may be trivial in itself is not enough to remove him from the scope of regulation, whereas here, his contribution taken for others may be similar situated as far from trivial. So even though in you individually, or in, so remember earlier, remember earlier the court was talking about how it had to have a substantial impact. Remember that word substantial? And remember how I said it meant anything at any point? This is the language that's taking it back. So remember earlier where I said, oh, it's only if it has a substantial effect? I said, well, substantial means anything. Here's where they're undoing that substantial thing. So they said, oh, it only means, it only it only applies if it would have a substantial effect. Here's where they're undoing that. Appellee's own contribution to demand for wheat may be trivial. In other words, not substantial. So Appellee's own contribution may be not substantial, which, you know, if we we're following what we said above, that would be the end of our discussion, right? We said only substantial. And now we're saying Appellee's contribution may be trivial, which is to say not substantial. But that by itself is not enough to remove him from the scope of regulation. Why? Because if it was taken together with others who were doing the same thing, it would not be trivial. So that's how substantial becomes unsubstantial. Right? You growing wheat on your own land, I mean, that's not that big a deal. But if you everyone did it, well, that'd be substantial. So we can only regulate things that are substantial. But if everyone did it, it'd be substantial. Therefore, it's substantial as to you. So, so it has to be substantial interstate commerce, by which we mean not substantial, not interstate, not commerce will be fine. This is fine. All this is fine. No problem. It is well established by the decisions of this course. The power to regulate commerce includes the power to regulate the prices that the commodities are dealt with. So everyone who thinks that the government should, you know, all, all the so, all the socialists out there, all the socialists out there, here's your case law for you. The U.S. Supreme Court in 1943 has no problem with the government dictating how much you're allowed to grow, how much land you're allowed to grow on, the price of it, how much you're paid, and so forth and so on.
centralized control 1943 style, guys. One of the primary purposes of the act in question was to increase the market price of wheat and to end the limit the volume of wheat could affect the market. It could hardly even deny the factor of such volume and variability of home consumption wheat would have substantial influence on the price of conditions. No growing wheat, man. It would, it, would, it, would hurt the, it would hurt the sales. This may arise because being marketable condition of such wheat overhangs the market and, if induced to rising prices, tends to flow in the market and check price increases. Yes, if it existed, if it existed, and prices went up, people might sell more of it, and then price would go down, because that's how supply and demand works, you see. That's, that's the problem, you see. This is how supply and demand works. You know, we want a certain price, and if if demand went up, if price, if price went up, if price went up, people might sell more wheat, but we want price to go up, so we can't let them sell wheat, because then there would be supply. So we want to artificially inflate the price by artificially reducing supply by preventing you from marketing and stuff in the first place. Homegrown wheat, in this sense, complete, competes with wheat and commerce. That's a great sentence right there. Homegrown wheat, in this sense, competes with wheat and commerce. Do any of you grow? Do, do, do any of you guys guys grow tomatoes on your home, or or maybe have like an herb garden or something? You're competing with big herb and big tomato. You're not allowed to do that, man. The simulation of commerce is use of regulatory functions quite definitely as prohibitions or restrictions. This leaves us no doubt that Congress may properly have been considered that we consume on the farm where grown if wholly outside the scheme of regulation would have a substantial effect. It is said, however, that this act, forcing some farmers into the market to buy what they could have provided for themselves is an unfair promotion of the market and prices of specialty wheat growers. So it's, it's, it says it's unfair that you're forcing people to buy stuff. It is of essence the regulation that lays a restricting hand on the self-interest of the regulated. Advantages from the regulation commonly fall into others. You're just being selfish. You're not allowed to be selfish. The conflicts of economic interest between the regulated and those who advantage by it are wisely left on our system to resolution by Congress. Such conflicts rarely lend themselves to judicial determination. And with wisdom, workability, or fairness, the regulations we have nothing to do. So the fact that you're forced into the commerce to buy something is not our problem. Thus ends the case of Wicked V. Filburn, one of my least favorite cases of all time, because it takes a provision of the Constitution and stands it completely on its head. Congress has the ability to regulate interstate commerce, but apparently that includes intrastate non-commerce. So Cong Congress has the power to regulate commerce as it flows across state lines, and that includes the power to regulate it as it doesn't flow across state lines. This is, in my view, anti-textualist. It doesn't make sense in view of the text. Congress has the ability to regulate international commerce, commerce between the United States and other states, and it has the power to make sure that state the trade between the states happens. But otherwise, it has no power. And to the extent it does, it can't be inter non-interstate non-commerce. That doesn't make sense. But this is how the court reasoned. This is good law. This is still precedent. It is one of my least favorite cases of all time. I hope it dies sometime soon, and that's the end of the coverage of this case. Thank you so much for being part of the Uncivil Law family. I appreciate your continued support. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to this channel, and you can also support us financially by clicking the applaud button below. Thank you so much for your contributions to our channel. It helps our work grow. Until later, cheers and goodbye.